Hi everyone, this is Nuclear Pep Talk and I'm Ksenia Bernaska, your local guide into a nuclear world. Nuclear Pep Talk is a platform where I ask 10 questions to break myths and fears about everything nuclear in simple words and with remarkable experts. And today we have a third episode of Nuclear Pep Talk. Thank you for all of your support and views in my previous in my previous episodes. I'm really grateful for that. Just take a moment of appreciation of a new gear that I got. Hopefully the sound is better this time and will be better from now on. So put your comment down below. Let me know whether it sounds better. And the topic of our third episode is going to be nuclear agriculture in Kazakhstan. Just to give it to you a little bit of a background, when we think of something nuclear, radiation, what we think of is energy and weapons. But actually, there are many more types of peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology that actually have nothing to do with energy or weapons. And one of them is the use of nuclear technology in agriculture. And today we have Ibira Kuandik, who is my dear friend, and she is a former research intern at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. That's actually where we met. And now she's working as an analyst in a Kleffman group. Uh, this is a company that is doing agricultural market research and that that's what she's doing right now. Uh, she's also passionate about disarmament security and development nexus, and she's rooting for sustainable agriculture. She's going to tell us about her insightful research on nuclear agriculture uh, in Kazakhstan. Specifically, she will be telling us about the development of that particular field and why Kazakhstan is doing it, most importantly. So, please welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ibira, for being with us today. And thank you for sparing time for Nuclear Pep Talk and uh, telling us about your wonderful research. And without further ado, the first question to you is how nuclear science and technology can actually be used in agriculture? Mm -hmm. uh, for this question, I would like to say about, uh, to start about Eisenhower's uh, famous speech that we all know. It's called Atom for Peace in 1953. And uh, since that time, uh, agriculture and food were, were among the potential areas of peaceful applications of nuclear science and technology. So in general terms, uh, nuclear applications in agriculture relying on the use of isotopes and radiation techniques to combat pests are used to combat pests and diseases, increase crop production, protect land and water resources, ensure food safety and authenticity, and increase livestock production. Um, and when I was doing my research, I classified their application in four broad areas, uh, such as uh, their application in crops production, in food products, in livestock, and in water resources. I don't think a lot of people actually knew that, you know, nuclear anything can be used in something like agriculture. Um, so that leads us to the next question. Isn't it dangerous to use ionizing radiation or basically anything that relates to radiation in agriculture or anywhere, actually? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it's uh, one of the main important questions, and it's uh, something that every everyone asks and uh, are interested in. So uh, when we speak about the use of isotope and radiation techniques in agriculture and in any other industry, we speak about their, of course, safe, secure, and sustainable application. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, in food processing, uh, when we process food uh, to increase their shelf life, for example, uh, by destroying uh, harmful microorganisms, um, we use uh, traditional methods. We used to use traditional methods such as heat and chemical processing. Uh, however, those methods, they are not effective enough and uh, they harm environments. Therefore, scientists uh, propose the radiation uh, as phytosanitary treatment for food and food uh, and agriculture products as a new methods of treatment that are safe for humans and for the environment too. Uh, 
Um, and uh, of course, it is the role of scientists to prove their safety. And uh, uh, and we, as uh, people from policy world, we rely on their conclusions. Uh, and according to them, um, products do not become radioactive. They do not have harmful effects on health. And at the same time, they retain their taste, smell, and appearance. Uh, this has been proved by um, uh, the safety of radiation processing of food has been confirmed, for example, by World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, <clears throat> and uh, radiation, for example, particularly as a phytosanitary treatment for food and agriculture products, uh, they are used uh, to increase exports, for example, of products. And it's used in more than 60 countries around the world right now, including countries like US, China, Canada, Netherlands, Australia. And uh, for example, they are used in processing meat, fish, chicken, seafood, uh, various <clears throat> fruits and vegetables, cereals and spices as well. Basically, it means that, you know, all of us can somehow face uh, different kinds of products that had been somehow processed or with their use of radiation and actually be safe and sound and enjoy our food. Yes, <laughs> Just, exactly. Yeah, yeah, which is, I think it's unimaginable for a lot of people because for most, like, I think for a lot of people, radiation is something really bad and dangerous. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's really important to know that it actually can be used for good and safely. Mm -hmm. And uh, you already touched up on the fact that these applications are used in 60 countries. But you're coming from a very particular country. You're coming from Kazakhstan and you've mm -hmm. done your research through the prisms of, of Kazakhstan experience. So can you tell us why are these nuclear applications in agriculture important for Kazakhstan? Maybe there are three main reasons why it is very important to use those technologies. Uh, first is, uh, I'd like to uh, share an example uh, that happened in 2021. Uh, Kazakhstan lost 20% uh, of uh, grain harvest due to drought. Um, so farmers were able to harvest only 15 million tons of grain out of predicted 20 million tons. Uh, so, which shows that uh, drought or other environmental um, environmental issues can uh, severely affect uh, livestock industry, food products, and also, most importantly, export supplies as well for the economy. Um, therefore, um, nuclear technologies in agriculture are essential to address most pressing global challenges such as climate change and hunger. And this is uh, particularly applicable for developing countries uh, and for countries that want to increase their uh, food supplies to ensure domestic uh, needs and also to export uh, as part of their uh, their policy to uh, improve and develop economy and particularly Kazakhstan it is uh, it exports agricultural products to 72 uh, countries and it's also one of the largest wheat exporters it's um, on the ninth place uh, in the world right now um, and also, I'd like to highlight the global importance as well, because Kazakhstan can uh, supply uh, those um, crops and food products to other countries regionally in Central Asia, in South Asia, and um, even to other global uh, destinations. Especially now, since we are in the middle of a global crisis, I would say, that's really, really important. And um, can you, you already mentioned about it, but can you go into more detail how well nuclear agriculture is developed in Kazakhstan and what are the existing challenges to its development in the country? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that in comparison to uh, nuclear medicine in Kazakhstan, which is developed quite well, and um, nuclear applications in other industries, uh, nuclear agriculture is still at the initial development stages. Uh, however, historically, uh, as early as in 1956, uh, Kazakhstan scientists highlighted the need for the development of peaceful atom uh, and their application in agriculture, healthcare, uh, 
Um, and now we see the very slow pace of uh, those applications. And uh, specifically in uh, agriculture in Kazakhstan, if we compare it to other countries, and it is attributed to uh, several factors. And of course, um, one of the main factors is radiophobia of the phobia of the population. The placement of the semi-palatings nuclear test site in the country has played a negative role um, in the population's perception of any manifestation of the atom, including peaceful atom. Um, secondly, it's more about uh, institutional uh, challenges, such as uh, lack of specialized scientific organizations and departments that directly that would be directly involved in research and uh, their application. Um, and maybe uh, another factor is the need for a clear identification by agricultural enterprises. So farmers, uh, we need to speak with farmers, we need to speak with private households that have uh, agricultural production and ask their needs and what uh, are their challenges and um, how nuclear applications can be used. You've talked about radiophobia and the legacy of semiplatin's nuclear test site. Um, I think a lot of people know very well um, the, the, tra the tragic situation that uh, happened in Kazakhstan 20th century. And uh, thanks God we don't really, we, we, we no longer um, have this nuclear test site uh, functioning. Due to this legacy, I understand that people probably have really negative attitude towards any nuclear technology, any nuclear applications. So can you touch up on the radiophobia a little bit more and how does public react to use of nuclear technologies in agriculture and maybe you have some ideas how to actually promote the peaceful uses that are safe and secure for uh, people and maybe something has already been done yes it's a great question and maybe um, one of the essential parts in this uh, development and uh I would say that, for example, when it comes to building a nuclear power plant in Kazakhstan right now, uh, public uh, the public's acceptance is um, hugely divided in two parts, maybe maybe more, but major two parts is one that are radically <laughs> against building a nuclear power plant, and another part which is uh, fully supports and considers it essential and necessary. Um, and I would say that it's hard to assess how public would accept a nuclear agriculture. However, I uh, think that the results will be similar to this one, how public accept nuclear power plant, which is also uh, peaceful uh, energy of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And um, <clears throat> it is uh, public perception of atom is negative in major sense. And this is what we um here and is a common maybe knowledge um and in my opinion uh, one of the main ways and maybe one of the main um kind of obvious uh, ways in which public acceptance level can be increased is uh, first investing into educational and awareness raising activities in illustrating the peaceful application of nuclear science and technology um, for example, in agriculture, and maybe illustrate how it is currently used in healthcare and in industry. Um, and when I was uh, speaking with lots of with lots of experts who have been work who worked or have been working with Kazakhstan in uh, particularly peaceful uses of nuclear energy in Kazakhstan, they told that uh, there is one institution that uh, shows. Um, um, any um, that shows uh, and illustrates um, use of nuclear science and technology, peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology. Um, however, I think that this is not uh, available for public, and maybe uh, this can be uh, one of the main ways to make it available for um, general population to maybe start it from school educational activities maybe to mm -hmm. run some uh, youth organization and it's currently developing actually also use uh, uh, 
awareness raising activities among youth. It's, um, I guess, taking a very good development. And uh, I hope this can help to maybe change in the future how we perceive uh, atom. Well, and I'm sure you will be one of the champions of raising awareness of raising yeah. awareness of the <laughs> peaceful uses of nuclear technologies in agriculture. Um, I hope. Well, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> I'm sure you'll succeed, and I hope our podcast will also uh, contribute to raising awareness about the peaceful applications of nuclear technology in agriculture and Kazakhstan. So, people from Kazakhstan, please watch podcast <laughs> and learn. Yes. and accept the future and the innovation. <laughs> yes, right. Thank you. While we're having a coffee break, can you tell us why actually you started to research nuclear agriculture? I don't think that's something very common to research. Mm, yeah, it's a very good question and actually maybe hard uh, for me to answer, but uh, I guess that... Um, um, the fact and actually maybe predictions that I see about uh, future um, food and agriculture <coughs> needs uh, is very threatening personally for me and I'm, I'm scared of that and that we will not have um, enough resources. And I think that the, currently is the time to um, think about that, to make more sustainable resources, uh, to make our practices environmentally friendly. And maybe this, um, this understanding and this really motivates me. Half of questions are done. So now we have our sixth question uh, on the plate. And can you tell us how does Kazakhstan use nuclear technology in food processing, mm -hmm. um, particularly? Mm -hmm. The country has technological capacity um, <clears throat> however, processing food products with external ionizing radiation is not widely used at the moment, and it is still at the stage of research and development. Uh, so one of the experiments that uh, I saw and read uh, was at the Park of Nuclear Technologies. Uh, they use ionizing radiation for food processing in uh, several promising areas uh, of Kazakhstan, and uh, it is um, first this infestation of rain crops um, to increase shelf life of meat products, uh, and also genetic selection of some crops uh, that uh, with the purpose of diversifying and with the purpose of making nutrition uh, more nutritious those crops, um, okay. and <clears throat> radiation. Um, as a phytosanitary treatment is reliable and it is environmentally friendly methods um, to uh, first increase shelf life of agricultural products and com commodities and to ensure their safety, uh, which preserves agricultural products uh, that farmers supply both to the domestic markets and that they are going to export. So basically food will be um, we will be safe and uh, uh, quality and uh, it will reach to a customer in a safe and secure manner. What about crops? How does Kazakhstan use nuclear technologies to increase crop production before actually getting food? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, in here it's um, also at a stage of research and development. However, um, there are many um, international efforts uh, that are helping country to um, use nuclear technology to increase crop production and there are projects such as uh, done by agency to develop drought tolerant crops uh, which is also essential because drought is one of the challenges that country is facing and also disease tolerant crops um, particularly in Kazakhstan, they developed uh, disease-tolerant and drought-tolerant wheat varieties, uh, and also they have enhanced they enhance nutritional content uh, using mutation breeding. Uh, so this is uh, how Kazakhstan is currently um, using nuclear technology in crop production. And um, when I was doing my research, uh, one of the conclusion was that. 
I sh uh, this research should step up and uh, it's possible by learning lessons from other countries uh, uh, such as China or uh, Canada. Um, there is also a need to make seeds uh, that will be available to farmers and uh, to commercialize uh, this research. Uh, how does Kazakhstan use nuclear technology to enhance livestock? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, it's this livestock uh, is the third field um, in agriculture, and um, I cannot speak much about uh, use for enhancing livestock productivity. However, it is promising field into areas uh, livestock feed and controlling diseases, because uh, one of the also challenges that country face in agriculture is that livestock number is decreasing. Uh, their count is decreasing and um, lack of feed is one of the major reasons for this decreasing trend. And uh, so when we speak about how nuclear is potentially can be used, we speak about uh, breeding the grasses uh, that can grow in harsh climates and can grow under harsh conditions uh, with shorter uh, growing periods and um, they can so that we can uh, have more uh, feed for livestock and as a result um, stop this decreasing trend. How do you see the prospects of nuclear agriculture development in Kazakhstan and globally in the mm -hmm. foreseeable future? Mm -hmm. um, in general terms and maybe in the very short terms I would say that prospects are very great and However, it needs um, thought, thoughtful consideration and lots of investment. Um, and maybe there are three main areas in which uh, nuclear agriculture in Kazakhstan can be or are very promising is uh, first developing uh, drought tolerant and disease tolerant uh, crops. Uh, second is to use phytosanitary treatment for food and agriculture products to increase their shelf life and quality. Uh, and third is to optimize uh, livestock feed. Globally, I guess it's also uh, very promising because lots of international organizations such as agency or food and agriculture organization, they have a lot, uh, they have many laboratories, uh, labs, and they have good experts. Um, they have good um, engineers and lab scientists. So. Um, it is promising for globally as well and for developing world. And when I was doing my research, I saw lots of countries in Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, um, how they are improving uh, their agricultural practices by using nuclear science and technology. Uh, and uh, actually their example motivated me to see and to look more about how it can be improved in other countries. I think that was a great summary, actually, of what already had been said before, so people actually remember uh, what are the applications and, you know, that sticks in their mind. Mm -hmm. And um, for, those, uh, for those who are newbies in the uh, nuclear energy or nuclear disarmament fields, uh, the agency, when Ibira said about agency, she referred uh, to International Atomic Energy Agency, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, beautifully based in Vienna, where we actually met with Ibira. Uh, so just for you to know, when uh, we call it agency, just because, you know, we're used to it, but, you know, some people might not know about that. Yeah. And also, I have a very difficulty of mm -hmm. pronouncing it like uh, IAEA, which is like my major yeah. challenge. IAEA, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's, when, you, when you say IAEA, it's more like singing, you know, IAEA. <laughs> yes. <Like>, that's <laughs> very, very melodic uh, name for the agency, I must say. So agency sounds a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you guys know, and I'll probably just insert um, insert the abbreviation here so you know uh, what it is and how it looks like. So IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, based in Vienna. Mm -hmm. A very great organization, Google it. That leads us to the very, very, very last question, uh, to the 10th question. And Ibira, can you, can you tell us how disarmament, disarmament and development linked? Because mm -hmm. you've been talking about development a lot, but I mean, it's not... 
isolated area and it is it must be linked to other areas that include uh, nuclear threats or nuclear challenges and how do you think disarmament and uh, development linked in now nowadays mm-hmm. uh, I think that um, development and disarmament they are mutually reinforcing processes uh, so disarmament uh, it creates conditions uh, that make favorable the development and development creates conditions favorable for disarmament so when countries think about uh, developing uh, development sectors such as agriculture trade uh, it will lead to a more peaceful societies and as a result uh, avoid any conflicts and um, and nuclear disarmament particularly uh, it's uh, It also includes the fact that we don't spend financial, technological and human resources on militaries and uh, which in fact diverts resources uh, from environmental or economic programs. Uh, therefore, these two processes, they are connected and uh, maybe, and I hope that our communities will uh, reserve funds for development initiatives and uh, Um, and some like emergency relief and um, rehabilitation operations uh, rather than on uh, military and um, military and other conflict related um, spendings well i think peaceful concept of uh, coexistence is what we need right now for sure 100% mm-hmm. so fingers crossed mm-hmm. that it's not just a utopia but actually something that is possible to happen so the morale is cut on military invest in development yeah. and uh, to 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 lead our planet and countries to more peaceful coexistence at least mm-hmm. Yes, great summary in one sentence. Thank you, Abira, so much for coming today and participating in the Nuclear Pep Talk. Um, I'm very happy that we met at the VCDNP, which is a Vienna Center for Design and Non-Proliferation, who doesn't know. We both interned at that organization and uh, and intern uh, at the moment. And uh, uh, I'm super happy that you had an opportunity to share your very valuable research with major public with with general public and i'm sure it's going to have a lot of effect on the future of kazakhstan and and globally uh, in terms of agriculture so, mm-hmm. so thank you for that i'm sure uh, our audience learned a lot today uh, something new that i i'm sure they didn't know uh, so thank you for that and for all of you thank you for watching and remember fear is here learn about nuclear bye mm-hmm. Thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, press the like button, subscribe if you want to see more. I post every two weeks on Friday, so make sure you're not going to miss the next episode, which will come in two weeks. And uh, for those who've done everything, we have nuclear acronym of the day. And today it is SIT, SIT. Has nothing to do with city. It actually has to do a lot with nuclear agriculture. And it is nuclear derived sterile insect technique. Yeah, I know it sounds very difficult and believe me, I also I also before that didn't even know that it exists, but apparently seed or SIT is a technique that helps to eliminate pests from the infected areas. Uh, how it's done? Well, they take male insects, they sterile them using ionized ster- sterile make them sterile using ionizing radiation and then those male insects are sent back to the infected areas to the past infected areas to the wild females and that's how it gradually helps to eliminate already established pests and helps to prevent the spread of other invasive species so that's that is very useful and it's actually much more environmentally friendly if we compare it to conventional pesticides Yeah, I know, radiation is more environmentally friendly than pesticides. One of the good examples is Ecuador, because Ecuador used this technique to eradicate fruit flies from the 
three species of fruits that they wanted to export. Because before you export something, you need to prove that these fruit flies are not present in the farms. So with the help of the Food and Agriculture Organization International Atomic Energy Agency Center, um, they uh, transferred three million of uh, fruit flies, male fruit flies, which had been sterilized using ionizing radiation, they had been sent to the area infected with wild female insects. And that's how they eradicated fruit flies there. And that's why Ecuador actually was able to export their fruits to the United States and earn $22 million alone in 2019. Oh yeah, by the way, from now on, I think this podcast or video cast deserved its own name and I don't mean nuclear pep talk but I mean the name name so I think we're gonna call it Newcast from now on nuclear video cast or nuclear podcast because I think nuclear podcast or video cast actually deserves its own name so from now on it's a new cast I leave the link down below for you to learn a little bit more about nuclear agriculture and various techniques that exist so you can self educate yourself a little bit more and on that note I'll see you in the next episode. See you soon. Bye.